about three or four minutes waiting on everybody to join and get settled. Hey, just letting you know you are in the right place. We'll get started in three or four minutes, so just hang tight. Hey everybody, this is Patrick Ferris with Broadloom. We'll get started in about two or three minutes. Just wanted to let you know you're in the right place. All right, we'll get started in one minute. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. All right, I think we're ready to go. I think we have enough uh, critical mass here joined. Today, we're going to talk about three strategies to boost sales and increase profitability. And there'll be pretty different dimensions and areas we're going into. Um, we're going to talk about uh, first, I'm the, why I'm here, I'm the general manager at Rollmaster. Uh, so I'm in charge of ERP and payments at Broadloom. 
And over the course of doing this in 15 years, I've visited hundreds of flooring dealers and I've really seen how different dealers operate from shop at home to retailers and people of all shapes and sizes. So what I'm bringing to the table here is kind of some best practices and what I've seen out in the field over the years of doing this. And then the three categories we're gonna hit pretty diverse. We will talk about lead capture and management, salesperson commissions, and installer retention and communication. So ways to uh, serve your installers better. And you guys can uh, ask questions as you go and we'll get to those at the end. So um, thinking about lead capture, uh, the worst thing you wanna do is be inconsistent and not have a process, have leads falling through the gaps, and also siloed information where it's not all in one spot where you have different sales reps doing things their own way and not having a company way of doing things. And when you think about like how that happens or how you got to where you are, if you're in the boat where you have inconsistent processes and inconsistent data, um, you, your business has evolved. And the, some things to keep in mind, response time is critical. Average response of a web lead is 17 hours. And 50% of leads will take the first person that reaches out to them. So when your client fills out a web form and you get that lead, um, they want a response right away. They're interested in flooring at that moment and they might not be interested two hours from now, they'll be busy. So I couldn't urge you enough to just drop what you're doing and contact that lead immediately. Um, it makes a huge difference. And a stat I've read out on uh, publications is calling within five minutes improves conversion rate 21 times. And we certainly do that internally. When we get a web lead, we try to drop what we're doing and reach out to them right away because that's when they're interested in your product. Now, I talked about you could have uh, inconsistent processes, siloed information, and how, how did you get there? Well, most businesses, when you start out level one, you have one person handling all the leads. Oftentimes, that's the owner of the company, so they really care about those leads or it's a management position, and they're really doing a great job of handling them. They're efficient. They're making sure everybody gets followed up because they really value every one of those leads. Then as your business grows, you end up with new hires. And they may try to job shadow and follow your path of following a lead, but um, over the course of time and multiple new hires, it gets fragmented and people are doing things different ways. So you really need to build processes in place and formalize these practices. And that can be not only like the system and how you follow up with it, but the words you use when you call back and the uh, nomenclature you use when you're trying to uh, nurture a lead and get them into the showroom or get them to a shop at home appointment. So when you're in that phase, when you've started to grow and have some sales reps, oftentimes you put tracking mechanisms in place like spreadsheets and emails or Google Sheets and things like that. And of course, that's better than nothing, but it's still not a system. You know, it's a, it's a mechanism, it's a track or it's a repository, but it's not a system that's going to allow you to grow and hold people accountable. So the real big change in your business is to make this lead follow-up be part of your DNA and make the importance of the lead and the follow-up be part of your culture where everybody's on that same page and everybody's doing things the same way and values the leads that much. One way to make it part of your culture is having metrics and managing those by those metrics. So tracking uh, length of time to initial follow-up, tracking conversion rates and things like that. And that's where software comes into play a little bit more. And that's where you need systems and processes beyond just a Google sheet that everybody logs into. So to that avail, uh, the one thing I try to instill in retailers is if you wanna boost your business, better follow-up of leads is the single easiest thing you could do. An average sale in this industry is upwards of $5,000, you know, and say a gross profit of 30, 35 points easily. So if you could just have one more sale for every single sales rep, it'd be a big boost on your business. And I have a hard time thinking, depending how good you are at lead follow-up now, that the right processes and systems in place would easily get one more sale per sales rep. 
So to do that, uh, the software or processes doesn't do it in and of itself. You have to have managers that hold sales reps accountable. You have to have meetings about the reporting and performance. And so if you're not already doing it, my uh, first piece of advice would be use software to track and manage your leads. There's many software programs out there. Obviously, I'm going to shamelessly plug ours. Um, next webinar next week is presented by Tyler Cobb. He's the senior product manager over RLM, Retail Lead Management. And here's a little screenshot of it. But he's going to do a deep dive on RLM, which will also teach you some best practices and go a few layers deeper than I did today. But that should help us all on uh, better ways to follow up with leads. And you can see how software can help assist you do that. All right, so first takeaway, follow up on your leads, pretty simple. All right, so the next topic is going to be sales commissions. And if I had to say, this is probably the one thing I get asked about the most is what should I be paying in commissions? And there's not a simple flat answer. There's a lot of variables in there. Um, so many variables that at FloorCon, I'll be talking about commissions for the better part of an hour. So consider this the light version. And if you're attending FloorCon, we'll have a very deep dive into commissions for about an hour straight on nothing but commissions. But this is usually a, a pretty hot topic. So some basic advice, work within your software. Whatever you do, whatever software system you're on to track your job costs and accounting, make your comp commission structure work with that. Uh, what I often see is a sales manager or an owner comes up with a wild commission structure and what they actually created was a reporting nightmare for somebody in the office to calculate. So whatever system you're using, you want to work in those confines so that you can have a proper commission structure and you're not creating a, a two-day job for your bookkeeper to calculate that all every month. We also want to keep salespeople out of those calculations. I mean, we want to show them to them, but we don't want the salesperson responsible for it. So I've seen that with a lot of companies where they don't have systems to auto-calculate margins and commissions, so they have the sales rep do it. Then the office has to double check it. So we want it all to be automated. So work within your software. Now, some other things you don't want to do is not timely, uh, tough to track, we kind of already covered, and incentivizing bad habits. And I'm going to hone in on that one a little bit, incentivizing bad habits, because that's another problem I see out there a lot. So some of the ways you could incentivize a bad habit is overusing of spiffs. So you might put a spiff on a certain product that you're trying to push, and that certainly has its place in your business. Uh, maybe you have some aged inventory, so you want to spiff that and try to get it to move. So there's certainly a time and a place for spiffs. Um, however, if you make it overly spiff laden, you risk that salespeople will gravitate to specific products they make more money on and not sell the right product for the application. So be careful on overutilizing spiffs. So the next one's probably the one I run into the most as a problem is cliffs. So you don't want your staff not to take a deal because it drops their monthly margin. So what I mean by that as a case in point is maybe your salesperson makes X. But if in the month they hold a margin above 35 points, they make a bonus. So the problem with that is you're incentivizing bad behavior. Um, let's say their bonus level is if they make 35 points on the whole month. Then they get a large opportunity for a cash and carry job, 20 grand, but it's only going to be 30 points. And it's a good deal for the company, but it might be bad for the sales rep because it's going to drop their margin down below that cliff and they could end up walking the business because it could actually cost them money. So one way to avoid cliffs is to pay and compensate based on every sale and not based on large monthly numbers. That way they get paid on the big deal at 30 points and the other deals at 40 points and they're incentivized accordingly on each one. So avoiding cliffs. And quotas are kind of another way you can do the same thing. Um, maybe you have a, a bonus when they hit a certain volume number. They sell 100 grand that month, they get a little bit extra. And that makes sense. You want them to sell 100 grand every month. But if I'm a sales rep and I've hit my quota, I've hit that extra tier for 100 grand this month, I might try to sandbag 
and shuffle some sales to next month so that I hit my tier next month again. So when you think about cliffs and quotas, you don't want to create these bad habits of sales reps where their interests are not aligned with your company. So one of those things uh, to do that is pay on every invoice. And what I mean by that is you might still pay monthly, but calculate the commission on every job or invoice independently so that they're making their money on that invoice for how well they did on that one. And the last sale is not helping or hurting the next sale. So paying on in every invoice solves clips and quotas quite a bit. All right. Now, uh, another real popular question is draw versus commission, draw plus commission or salary plus commission. So salary makes sense to a lot of people because they think, oh, I'm hiring somebody. They need, you know, food on the table. So they need a weekly base draw salary. Um, I would encourage you to make that salary actually a draw. So I'm just going to rattle off some numbers. Maybe you're paying somebody uh, 40000 a year plus 2% of the sales. All right. And that would be a salary plus commission. Now, conversely, if you paid somebody a draw plus commission, you could pay a higher commission rate, but that draw comes out of it. So maybe you're going to pay 7% of the sales but that 40 grand draw is going to come out of the commission. When you compare the two methods and you bust out a spreadsheet and calculate it every which way, salary plus commission rewards mediocre salespeople because they're going to get paid regardless. They're getting their 40 grand regardless. They're getting their plus 2%. And maybe you have uh, quotas and different things like that in place to try to mitigate that. But at the end of the day, salary plus commission will reward mediocre sales reps. And consequently, it's going to punish your best sales reps. Your best sales reps are going to want to draw plus commission because they're going to want a, a higher percentage. So if they really kick butt and have a great month, they're going to make more money. And then their draw, you paid them that 40 grand in this example would come out of their commissions and they get everything above that. So you can calculate this out any way you want, but draw plus commission rewards the best sales reps. Salary plus commission rewards mediocre sales reps. I do believe they need a draw and they need, you know, regular income, but calculating their commission against that draw is going to allow you to reward them more. So uh, the other big question is how much should I pay? You know, what percentage? And I'll talk in a little bit about industry averages, but there is no canned answer. Um, two big factors I'd put into play with how much I should pay a sales rep would be how much work do they do? And what I mean by that is besides selling the job, do they have to schedule it, purchase the goods, work with the installer, you know, uh, print work orders for them and deal with the installer? Or have you set up uh, infrastructure for the rep where they sell the job? And you've got a purchasing department or person to order the goods. You've got an installation manager to schedule it and work with the installers. And essentially that sales rep gets to sell the job and move on to the next one. So if the sales rep's doing everything, then they probably need a higher percentage. If they're able to just sell it and move on to the next sale because you've spent the money on putting this infrastructure in place, then you're able to pay a little bit lighter on the commission because they're spending more time selling. Then uh, another uh, facet of that would be, how are the leads coming in? If your sales rep is really self-generating leads, they're pounding the pavement and knocking on doors and they're getting their own leads, they deserve a higher commission. If you have a really high advertising budget or you have an indoor, you have a nice retail location on a main thoroughfare, then you can actually pay a little bit less commission because you're driving traffic and you're keeping the sales rep busy with us. So again, if your sales reps generating their own leads and managing their own jobs, you're going to have to pay a little higher commission because they're not spending as much time selling. And if you're bringing in a ton of leads and you have the infrastructure in place, you can pay a little bit less commission than the next company. All right, so percent of sale versus percent of profit. So do I want to pay... For example, 7% uh, of the sale, that's of the gross sale, total sale, excluding sales tax, or 23% of the gross profit. So
So these numbers are on my screen because these are the industry averages. 7% of the total sale or 23% of the gross profit. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these are just averages. There's not like a real rhyme or reason to what's perfect for your company until you analyze how, how much you're spending on advertising, how much you're spending on infrastructure. But these would be the industry averages based on sale or profit. All right, so here's a sample commission structure. Um, this is what I would call a sliding scale percent of profit. So at the top tier there, if this sales rep sells a job above 33% gross profit, they get 30% of the profit. If they're between 29 and 32.9% profit, they get 28% of the profit. So essentially, they're getting a share of the profit, but as their margin goes down, their share of the profit goes down as well. Um, by far, this is the most recommended type of plan. The percentages, the ranges would vary by company, but this structure doing a sliding scale percent of profit would be the most recommended. And when I look at our largest clients, the vast majority of them pay in some type of structure like this. Then oftentimes you have a floor where the sales rep gets nothing. And then you may also have a chargeback floor. So that bottom tier here where we get into negative numbers, I'm actually going to claw back 25% um, from the, the loss against their commission. Now, Digressing to something I said earlier, you want to play, pay a commission structure within the confines of the software you use. So if you're on an ERP like Rollmaster, this is built into it. You can set up this commission structure. If you're on, say, QuickBooks, you're probably creating a nightmare for your bookkeeper to calculate commissions at the end of the month. So I couldn't stress enough, you know, don't come up with a plan this robust if your software isn't ready to handle it. Otherwise, you just created more work for your staff. But sliding scale percent of profit is the way to go. All right, so some important takeaways there. Figure out how often you're paying, paying weekly, paying monthly. Um, figure out if you're paying on the invoice or when the invoice is paid in full. Um, that's a big fork in the road. Uh, the majority of our clients do what I refer to as pay when paid. So they pay commission when they've been paid in full. And that, of course, helps with cash flow and also helps you have less clawbacks against the sales rep. Keep the plans as simple as possible, mainly so it's automated and you're not creating a reporting nightmare. Uh, consider draw versus salary, with my recommendation being to go the draw route. And consider percent of sale versus percent of profit, with my recommendation being percent of profit, if you can reasonably calculate that. All right, so I mentioned this earlier, but FloorCon's coming up, and you can register at experiencefloorcon.com. Um, we'll have a lot of great speakers there, and myself, and I'll be doing a deep dive on commissions, and I'll put together a lot of robust examples and what ifs, uh, scenarios and talk about if you're not in a commission commission environment now, how to move to that and how to calculate what your commission should be. And we'll also talk about how to motivate people that are on commission and easily show them how they can make more money next year. So we'll go full hour on commission, which is usually a hot topic. So again, shamelessly plugging experiencefloorcon.com to get registered. All right. So final topic, installer retention and communication, and we will open it up for Q&A at the end of this. Um, practices to make sure your installers stick around and how to improve communication with them. So we all know installers are hard to come by, or good installers at least. So we want to try to make the, it as easy to work for you as possible. So some things you can do is incentivize top performers. Uh, maybe try to pay more frequently. Uh, some method I've seen people do is pay in via ACH or Venmo or PayPal. And then digitize their invoicing process. So make it easy on them to send you a bill. And some methods you can use technology to help you with that um, would be diagrams, work orders in multiple languages like Spanish, um, uh, install calendar that they have access to in a mobile app. 
So diagrams, uh, what we have up here as an example is a residential diagram drawn out in Measure Square. So if you're not using Measure, R, Measure Square already, it's a no-brainer. Um, we can get you signed up and set up with a free trial. Um, just shoot me an email. Um, but we're happy to get anybody going on that. It's really easy to get up and running, and you're out there with an iPad and a laser, and A, you look a lot more professional than the person not doing it, unless, of course, you put the seam in the doorway there. But B, you're able to shave yardage and speed up the learning curve process for new hires where they can go out and measure a job. And then lastly, that diagram is going to clearly communicate the scope of the job to the installer. And then speaking of clearly communicating, here's an example of a Spanish work order. So this is a work order printed out of Rollmaster. And we did a Spanish translation. And you can do about any language. I think we've added 10 languages now. Um, I was on site a couple of weeks ago. We printed one in Portuguese. But this basically, all the notes you put on the job and scope of the job are going to print in English. But it's also going to print in a secondary language based on the installer's preference. So it can only help to communicate these scopes of the job in their language. Don't lose anything in translation, literally. And then another component would be giving them access to the schedule. So this could be a mobile app where they're peering into your schedule. And typically you would not want to just give them full access where they see the whole schedule. You just let them see their part of the schedule so they know what jobs they have coming up. And that way they know what the work week looks like and they're not calling your installation manager uh, Friday trying to figure out how busy they are next week. Um, the app could also communicate scope of the job, diagram, and things like that. And they can also invoice through the app. So the installer picks up the work order on their cell phone, basically, consider it a mobile work order. And then when they're completed with the job, they can submit an invoice to you. And that does a number of things. Um, a, they should submit an invoice because they're an independent subcontractor and they should be invoicing you as an independent subcontractor. It's frowned upon if, they, if you just pay them off of your work order and they don't invoice you. When we're trying to draw that line between employee and subcontractor, it looks better that they send, submit an invoice to you. Additionally, that invoice will provide clarity of the scope of the job, the quantity, how much they're making and all that. And if their invoice is derived from your system, then it's your rates, your agreed upon labor charges, not what they filled in. So this also makes your back office life easier when they're paying out the installers because there should be less discrepancies. Everything should be on the invoice and you should be crystal clear at what the installer is making on the job. And if he wants to get paid for extras like floor prep, he needs to get those approved in advance. So invoicing through the app helps facilitate that. All right, so summarizing, you know, happy leads, happy sales reps, happy installers, uh, you should be able to make more money. And we all need to increase profitability around this time. So um, taking care of your reps and installers and nurturing and following up with your leads should accomplish that. All right, so Q&A time. I'll give a minute for anybody to type in anything from the audience. Quiet bunch. All right, so uh, question about leads. Couldn't I track it in a Google Sheet? And of course you could track it in a Google Sheet, right? You could put all your leads in a Google Sheet but what that's not going to give you is reporting and data about close rates, what margin did you close at, um, who's following up, who's behind, and frankly, a Google Sheet you can kind of pencil whip. You can just type whatever you want in there. There's not uh, good tracking in history. So a Google Sheet would work in the early phases of your business, but when you want to take it to the next level, you need a program to add that accountability. Oh, that's a good one. And I saw Buddy commented his sales staff would quit if he didn't have estimating software. <laughs> um, the question was, I tried an estimating program once, and I was quicker on pen and paper. And 
I can kind of agree with that. Back when I was in retail, I got really good at measuring and I could be in and out of a house in 15 minutes and have the whole place measured and the carpet laid out. Uh, the problem is I didn't necessarily uh, draw it out. So the installer didn't have a clear picture of what's going on. Then the other problem is the homeowner might call back and change their mind and decide they want plank in the living room instead of carpet. And depending how well I drew it out, I might have to go back there and measure it again. Or at minimum, I'm spending five, 10 minutes reworking my numbers. And when you have it in an estimating software, then you can tweak it around and, and move it quickly and easily and requote the client. Now, then uh, the last reason I would say about estimating software, and perhaps the most important, is as you grow in scale, you want to be able to train people and get them on board quicker. You want to be able to hire somebody that may not know how to draw carpet already. So you want you need to remove that barrier and you want to hire the best salesperson out there and you want to get them to hit the ground running as quick as possible and not be worried they're going to be short on a job. So yeah, sure, you the owner of the company could probably measure faster on pen and paper but the new person you hire next week probably can't, and they're gonna make more mistakes than you are. So that to me is the real reason to use estimating software, but it is one of many. And I did see a question from Cameron Ling about uh, talking about commissions. Uh, you are welcome to reach out to me, Cameron. So it said, I'm already a customer. Who can I talk to about commissions quicker than conventions? So uh, by all means, reach out to me. My email address is patrick.ferries at broadloom.com. You should see that under my name here. But shoot me an email and I'll be happy to run through some commission scenarios with you. And I had a comment from somebody rather than a question, uh, Jeff. He said, when all orders originate as leads, then the data is substantial. And that is so true. The amount of data you can get once you start tracking your leads, your close rates, all the way through the process of a sale is huge. And it's actionable data that'll help you make more money. And another comment, uh, Buddy Mitchell said, uh, RLM measure squares transformed his business. And I'd, I'd have to agree on how people can operate without them. Obviously, it happens, though. Um, and then a question on commissions. Is percentage of sale or percent of profit more common to see? So common is an interesting question. If I had to say more common, probably percent of sale, just because it's easier to calculate. Um, but if I had to say what is more common with my largest and most successful customers, customers doing millions and tens of millions in volume, clients where the owner might take six months a year and go to Florida. Those are nine out of 10 times a pretty aggressive percent of profit plan. So as an industry, percent of sales more common just because it's easier to calculate. But if you narrow it to large successful operators, percent of commission is head and shoulders above the rest. And then I saw a question with, uh, from Mike about what online calendar app do you recommend? So naturally I'd recommend Rollmasters if you use Rollmaster. But the real key I would say is you want something that integrates with your day-to-day -day processes. Um, if you get a standalone calendar app, then you've created double entry. So whatever your core business software is, I'd recommend a calendar that integrates with that. So if you run QuickBooks, get a calendar that integrates with that. I oftentimes see dealers as they grow, um, before they've gotten an ERP software, they start buying estimating, calendar, lead tracking, then they go to put an ERP in like Rollmaster, and they're trying to reconfigure all their processes, where our recommendation would be start at the core of the ERP and work your way outward, so it all works together and you're not hodgepodging a bunch of apps together. But the short answer, Mike, is a calendar app that'll integrate with your accounting and ERP would be what I'd recommend. We'll give it another minute, see if we have any more questions here. All right.
Jeremiah. We'll wrap up Q&A unless somebody jumps in. So uh, next week, same time, same place, we've got Tyler Cobb, and he's going to do a much deeper dive than I did on lead tracking um, and, you know, how to fix a leaky lead bucket, what that means and what it's going to cost you and how you can fix it. So hopefully you guys are